which has signed up for the RIBA Climate Change Challenge 2030 and Architects Declare. He is also a member of the St Albans DAC. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, David. Uh, you can all hear me okay? Yes. yes. Good. Um, making the change, uh, some practical architectural issues. I don't know if any of you have uh, heard Catherine Ross's talk that preceded this. Um, if you have, uh, do forgive me for overlapping a lot with her and probably repeating some of the things as, of, of, of what she said. Um, I'm, I'm Mark Edison. I intend to talk for about 20 minutes uh, before the questions. I'm an architectural practitioner, uh, director of MEB Design, and we've been working on many churches, parish churches uh, across the country for many years. Um, for my sins, I, I sit on the DAC of St Albans. So if you have any issues about DACs, um, I might be able to try and answer the, your questions. Um, and uh, as net zero carbon has kind of come to the forefront, it's started to really impact the way we think about church buildings. Um, climate change has become a mainstream issue, as you know. Um, we have to address our buildings. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen for most of this talk. Uh, just get there. If we look at this little picture, um, you can see that about 36% of these gases that are destructive are produced from construction and from the construction industry. Uh, so that's a very high percentage. Um, not all buildings are, um, are churches, obviously, and residential buildings take up the majority of that. But the design choices we make as we think about buildings, um, particularly in terms of the materials used, uh, the, the heating systems, have a big impact. This talk primarily addresses church buildings because the Church of England estate is already in existence. So it's not my intention to discuss uh, this word embodied carbon in new construction, like extraction, manufacture, transport of materials, you did, this is a very important aspect, but this presentation is really about energy use because carbon has already been embodied in the fabric of the estate. The other thing I'm not gonna talk about is water use, though that's also important. So the first thing to say is demolition is not green. Um, some churches have a lot of problems I find with their ancillary accommodation and want to demolish. Well. Demolition is not good because it will lose all the embodied carbon in that construction, uh, unless you can probably recycle most of the materials. So we need to think carefully about demolition. I'm gonna look at probably two or three main questions around the practical issues of church buildings and what their contribution to greenhouse gases could be. Um, is change possible? And how do architects in particular see the process what options there are, and what maladaptions should be avoided. Again, forgive me for probably repeating things, but um, we're familiar with the background. Um, the greenhouse gas is rising exponentially, um, that we've got to move away from producing those gases and go renewable, uh, that we can't just stay where we are in the current equilibrium. We need to actually reduce carbon use. Um, Interestingly, the national grid is greening quite well. Uh, I was shown this and uh, repeat it, that the CO2 emitted per kilowatt hour in 1970 was 750 grams. And if you compare that with 2020, it's now 200 grams. So the grid is doing quite well. And if in 2030, we got down to 100 grams, that would be great. But I think um, Boris Johnson is looking to achieve zero by 2030 for all residential buildings, according to his, his speech to the Conservative Party conference. So this is quite good news. Um, there's also uh, a lot of thought about greening the UK's gas supply infrastructure, because most of the heating burns gases that we use. And um, I'm told that hydrogen about uh, can actually be uh, quite green. I don't know what the cost involved is, but 
this has implications for our boilers down the road. Um, and who knows where we will be with this in 10 years time. So the question is really where to start. Um, change is possible. Some churches have achieved net zero carbon. Um, and uh, this is what we've got to uh, try and do is balance this scale that the energy consumed each year is lighter or equal to the renewable energy we generate each year from our buildings. And there are, uh, as Catherine pointed out, some electricity suppliers who are already green, and these are two of them, bulb and ecotricity. So a start can actually be made by um, reviewing who your electric electricity supplier is. I don't know what the additional cost, if any, is of using a, an ecological supplier like bulb or ecotricity, but a start could be made by switching to to one of these suppliers. But from the perspective of, of an architect, we, we would encourage churches to um, develop a holistic plan to get towards net zero carbon. Um, that would involve having a clear understanding of how much energy your church building uses, it, uh, uses who needs it, where it is needed and when. Then we need a clear understanding of where the opportunities and problems with the fabric lie um, the second law of dynamics means that things have to be replaced at some stage. Uh, the walls, obviously, not very often. Um, the roof coverings may be a bit more often. The floor may be occasionally. But the heating system, probably reasonably often in the lifetime of a building. So uh, we need to know when these things are likely to happen, what opportunities they provide for replacement and for upgrading. Um, and then a thorough and sensible examination of what sensible options there are and the costs involved. Um, and then when you've got that sort of information, a roadmap can be produced and a funding strategy developed. And DACs like to see this kind of process documented. So if you are thinking about uh, upgrading fabric, about going uh, PV panels, using PV panels, et cetera, et cetera, do go through this process and document it because the DAC likes to see the argument, it likes to see the narrative, and um, it will help them understand why you want to do what you want to do and will balance and weigh the arguments against the implications on the aesthetics of the building and its special interest. So um, where to start? A, a good understanding of where your energy is and what the rating of the building is is important. Uh, you're familiar with the, um, these kind of uh, pictograms and what have you. The, uh, this is something that you use on appliances uh, uh, to rate uh, the energy efficiency of your, uh, your washing machine, for example, or even the house that you're buying. But there are other tools. Uh, infrared photography is, is very useful. This particular photograph shows where the heat is coming out of this building. And you can see it's coming out mostly through the roof. Uh, because that's where the warmest part of the fabric is. Um, I don't know uh, what tools the Anglican Church has produced yet or had to use them, um, and it might be something, David, you can comment on later from any feedback that you've had from the tools available to help a church understand its energy position. Um, so infrared photography is one of them. Once an understanding is in place, a careful look at the realistic options and an evaluation should follow. And these are mostly going to probably follow two considerations. The first would be a, a, what we might call a fabric first approach, what you can realistically do to the fabric, um, which includes the heating system to reduce heat loss and make the building more, more energy efficient. And then the second would be what renewable options might be possible and affordable in the building. At first glance, the methods that are quite familiar to upgrade your home um, may be acceptable. Um, some will be easy gains, quick gains, and some will be longer term and need planning. Um, he here is a typical 20th century church. I'm gonna deal with historic buildings a bit later on, but we'll start with more modern buildings. Um, this particular church is one we're involved with. Quickly and cheaply and easy wins would be to 
draft strip windows and doors to reduce the warmed air liquid leakage through the fabric and to limit too much air movement internally, uh, to insulate the heating pipes, unless part of the heating strategy for the building includes the heating pipes, of course, um, and insulate roof voids, much as you would do at home. In, in the shorter to medium term, you might introduce draft lobbies, you might change to LED lights, and that's something now quite well understood and quite common. Then in a slightly more long term, um, upgrade doors and windows. Interestingly, this church has replaced quite a number of windows uh, with double glazing. Um, you might insulate the walls. If you've got cavity brick walls, you can insulate the cavity. Some churches might consider ins insulating the walls by lining internally, though obviously an implication of that will be that you'll limit and reduce the internal floor area. And then in the longer term, uh, you can increase the insulation of the floors and the roof. In, the reason we got involved with this church is because their aluminium roof is coming to the end of its life. And in the process of renewal, the church is going to take the opportunity to actually seriously upgrade the insulation of that roof um, more than is currently required by statute under the building regs. Um, but of course, the need to change the roof does not come along very often. In this case, it's probably after about 60 years. Um, and then we come to finally, probably to the installation of more efficient boilers or different heating methods. And when the moment comes, uh, that might be sooner than you think because boilers, heating systems, particularly boilers need replacing once every 25 to 30 years. Um, as most churches are gas or oil fueled, the source of heat will be a particular issue and challenge if our immediate future is to being shaped to decarbonize the electricity grid. Um, but is this the future then if we're going electric? Uh, radiant um, panels that are quite visually obtrusive and, and possibly disturbing. Um, the answer is not necessarily so. Um, I understand I've not actually used radiant electric panels, which aren't red, um, but more like radiators. I don't know how good they are, but they certainly have been mooted as a possibility. Uh, another thought to uh, the use of air source heat pumps. Uh, these are becoming common, powered by electricity, which might be solar. Uh, they are effectively refrigerators in reverse. And if combined with a lower level of heat intervention, through say underfloor heating, they may be a, a fitting option, but not every church is suited to underfloor heating, particularly if it's used very infrequently. Um, we mentioned hydrogen as a fuel source. It's not something any mechanical electrical services consultant has proposed yet on any of the buildings we've been involved with, but it is something possibly to look out for in the future. And these things are changing so fast. We, we need to keep up. Um, we come now to historic buildings. Old buildings such as this one illustrated really can't be treated in the same way as newer 20th century buildings. And that's probably any building built after about 1919. It's much harder to upgrade the fabric. They behave differently. Many are heritage listed as this one. It adds to the challenge of obtaining faculties, listed building consents, obviously, and in some cases, uh, particularly with PV panels, planning permission. Here, here is a picture of how a, an old building works. Um, environmentally, it's designed to breathe. There are no barriers to moisture movement, and there's a reliance on an equilibrium of the uptake of moisture, evaporation cycles, and internal air movement. The problem is not moisture, it's excessive moisture. And care and understanding is needed if you are going to intervene. These buildings are not like the modern sealed envelopes we design today. If we take the idea of increasing insulation, how do you improve the thermal efficiency of the walls if this stops the fabric from breathing? If you dry lined without thought, moisture will find a way to express itself somewhere often where you don't want it. We have found 
um, one product that can be used to line historic walls, um, which breathes. Uh, so that, should, that might be suitable. This is not very old, but it's certainly come, come to the fore now that we need to find ways to insulate historic walls that still allow them to breathe. If you add insulation to roofs, you've also got to be careful that you don't introduce condensation by installing insulation in the wrong way in the wrong place where excessive water may form and stay hidden. Floors are even harder to insulate unless they're being renewed um, as here. But again, the solution must be breathable. You can't use standard damp proof courses that you might use in modern buildings because these buildings were designed without them, so don't need them. Then the original design, as we showed in the uh, illustration three or four slides ago, requires good internal ventilation, um, which were originally provided by drafts, um, and that was needed to remove the moisture buildup. So if you're very overzealous with your draft stripping, you could be doing something that's damaging to the internal fabric. Um, you come across secondary glazing probably quite often. Again, if you put that on an old stained glass window, it's likely to increase the condensation on a fragile leaded came because the air movement is inhibited and condensation requires air movement to help remove it. So double glazing church windows in, in old buildings is, is probably not a good idea at all. And if you're thinking about changing the heating system, say to um, an air source heat pump, uh, you obviously have to think quite carefully about the, the visual implications of an external location. In this case, you can see that there's this big white uh, air source heat pump and you might put um, a fencing around it, but in this case, they're going to put plants around it and screen it that way. So there is quite a lot to think about. Um, once you've decided on a plan to improve or not the efficiency of the fabric, the next question arises as to whether there are reasonable technologies and appropriate ones that could be installed that are renewable. Um, the most likely would be the ubiquitous PV panel. Again, um, quite common, but there are quite a few issues with installing PV panels that you have to cover. Uh, there's the loading, uh, it adds weight to the roof structure. There's the future growth of adjacent trees, which may one day grow tall enough to shade the panels. There's the orientation. I don't know how many uh, times you've seen uh, photovoltaic panels facing not exactly south, uh, quite a lot north. And you think, why on earth did they get that so wrong? Um, so there's uh, that and there's also the visual impact of photovoltaic panels, which may not be appropriate in some instances um, and particularly difficult on listed buildings uh, where the statutory authorities are going to probably have to become less stringent and more understanding. There are other options. There's uh, biomass heating um, based on the presumption that carbon dioxide released by burning wood would be replaced by trees as they grow. Um, this system has, I think, fallen out of favour a bit, probably because it doesn't actually help to reduce levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere overall. However, it's still an option. And of course, there are the um, ground source heat pump solutions that, or suggestions that, 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 are, that are available these days that take heat out of the ground and, and use it in the building. I think what we have to say, uh, there's no one solution that fits every circumstance. An infrequently used building will need a different approach to one that's used 24 seven. A rural building will need a, a different approach to an urban one. Um, so your plan will need to be shaped by individual circumstances. And then obviously there are costs. These things have to be paid for. Funding will be probably the biggest challenge. And all I can say is that uh, from an architectural perspective, it may be helpful to encourage you to look at a cost benefit analysis and carrying that out in order to perhaps refine your plan and, and understand what level of benefits arise or not from what you're going to spend. 
It can also be used to help you understand what time will be required to pay back the money you invest and save running costs. Uh, I don't think there's any magic wand. You may want to install PV panels, but now um, that, that would be fine because you, you would have an incentive financially to sell the electricity you generate back to the grid. But as times moves forward uh, and the grid decarbonizes, the incentive will become less until it ceases to offer any return when the grid actually becomes carbon neutral. You may ask, well, why don't we wait till the grid is neutral or that we have, for example, hydrogen boilers? Let's wait till 2030. But I think there remains this overarching imperative to do what we can to reduce these greenhouse gases now. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, Mark, for, uh, for that. Uh, just a few points um, coming out of that. You, you asked if I could say something about our experience of, uh, of energy assessment tools, such as the energy footprint tool and 360 degrees of carbon. You've come to the wrong person and the wrong diocese for that, because unfortunately, because our system hasn't been linked up with the national church system, we haven't been able to use the energy footprint tool. We're hoping to put that right in the next uh, couple of months. But I think if people listening to this workshop or taking part in this workshop have experiences, it would be very helpful if they could put those on the, on the chat line so we can see what other people um, have got to say um, about that. Um, just a couple of other points, I think. I mean, Mark made the point about each church having its own circumstances and really needing its, its own plan. I think one of the key things is this issue of whether the church can be heated using electricity and hopefully green electricity. And if you do have a church where um, maybe the use is, uh, is not frequent and you can use things like fuel heaters and panel heaters close to where people are sitting, then that's a possibility. But there are many churches where that will not be possible for many reasons. Then you get into the issue of the fact that the main heating sources are for gas and oil, as Mark suggested, which are producing carbon. There are things coming forward, such as, um, such as hydrogen. I noted one of the people um, making a comment about that, saying that that wasn't as um, uh, a, a totally brilliant either for very that had drawbacks with it. So I think we'll have to see with that. But I think it is a, a kind of a key issue going forward really is can you heat with electricity? Do you have an electricity supply either on site or delivered through through the grid? Um, or are you going to be reliant on oil or, or gas um, heating for the foreseeable future? And will there be technological developments which we can future-proof new equipment for, such as hydrogen or green gas, um, or are we going to have to wait for some of those developments to come forward? Obviously, churches are operating on quite a a long lifespan in terms of their heating systems too. And Mark mentioned 25 years, uh, 25 years with, with, with that. Okay, so that's me having my six planet work. Um, if we move over now to the questions people have asked um, before the workshop, which we've had in the last um, few days, um, just put these to Mark. Um, and the first one is, we've had a number of uh, questions asking whether making big reductions in the carbon used by historic and other church buildings is actually re realistic. Can they get to net zero carbon? Um, well, I think there are examples of churches that have done that. Um, St. James's Piccadilly, I think, would be a, a, a highly historic building, um, quite a big one in the middle of, uh, of London. Um, and I understand that that has achieved net zero carbon. So uh, I, I can't verify that, but I'm told that's the case. So it, it clearly is possible. Yeah. Is it possible in all churches? I, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think the answer is uh, obviously the money is, in, is, is critical, but it, it ought to be possible. Yes. I think it would be. Yeah. With the right technology. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second question is that, that some people have asked whether consent will be given for reducing energy use and generating renewable energy on site when churches are listed. Uh, I think the, the questions we've had on this have an element of frustration 
uh, in them. Yeah. And the examples quoted are, uh, will secondary glazing for stained glass windows be accepted? Um, the replacement of lead roofs with insulated stainless steel panels, solar PV panels, and dividing up churches to get easy to heat spaces. Would all of those kind of things be permitted? And if they want, should they be permitted? Uh, I can't say that they would be permitted. It, it, it's very circumstantial, but uh, dependent on location, interest, etc. I think um, if you've got a listed building, you, you have to understand that it's been listed for a reason, that there are um, heritage um, if you like, issues that are, are important and significant in that building and that the church really needs to understand what those are because that's why it's been listed and anything that impacts that interest, that special interest, is going to be of concern. Uh, the issue obviously is a, a, a balance between, if you like, the special interest and the need if you can demonstrate that your need, if you like, ha is going to have an impact that is less than significant, um, you've got a chance. If it's going to do significant damage to the interest, you don't have much chance. But once you get into the, that area of being less than significant, you can put forward your public benefit arguments. And the statutory authorities have a duty to weigh that. And that's what we do in DAC meetings. And I think if you're going to want to do these things, you need to have, as I said before, um, created the argument and documented it well and put forward a good case. And I think if you do that, uh, the statutory authorities will be much more willing to, to look at what you want to do. So I, I would say don't not do anything because you're fearful of the DAC's reaction. Um, put forward your ideas, but put, put, forward the, put them forward logically uh, in, in a way that assesses their impact on the historic interest, the special interest. You know, if a building is, is, has got great archaeological interest, then what goes on above the ground isn't necessarily going to impact that special interest. But if it is architectural and aesthetic, clearly, um, you know, that picture I showed of, a, of an infrared um, electric heater is going to have a huge impact and, and probably not going to be particularly light. So, but if you've done your research and you've found infrared panels that are radiant, that they fit in with the background, you can put forward your argument. So each case will be individual, but do the research, look at the options, come up with the preferred option and argue it well. And the DAC will look at it. And I think the DAC is it, one of the, as a practitioner, um, I've found that the, the DAC likes good presentation. So present well. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mark. I know with uh, Historic England, really just repeating what you're saying, that you know they very much say that if there is harm to the heritage significance of a building, but public benefits which outweigh that harm um, have been demonstrated, then they are opening open to seeing changes, and yeah. they're very much looking for churches to continue in use, um, and that's the best way of ensuring their long-term sustainability. Yeah. So I think they are open to that, but obviously still need to balance um, heritage significance against, uh, against impact uh, in, in, in that way. Um, the, next, the next question, um, which combines, um, I think, two or three questions, is some people have asked what they should consider when thinking about renewing heating systems or introducing solar PV panels. Again, it's down to the, the individual circumstance, I think. Uh, if you have a busy 24 seven church, um, it will require a, a, a probably a different heating solution to a church that is used one day a week and not many hours of the day of that week. Um, it, it would be pointless putting in an underfloor system, heating system into a church that you, is used very infrequently. Um, but if you have a church that is 24 seven, it may well be that an underfloor heating system is, is a very good way of, of, of heating the building but obviously it will require a lot more money. Um, a, a parish church out in the country that's used irregularly um, under, under pew heaters would be much more appropriate. So there is no one solution that fits all. It, it, it has to be assessed on a, on a building by building basis. Okay, um, I know you did say something about 
hope PV panels and how they should be considered as well during your uh, during your presentation. Yes. Um, the final of these questions is: We've also been asked about examples of, of of good practice, and I think within our diocese we've certainly had examples of where people, for example, have used air air source heat pumps. We haven't probably had the sort of the full works going towards net zero uh, carbon. And I know that the uh, the Withington case, um, seeing a presentation about that recently, the architect there was saying that. Um, that they were a zero carbon, I think, 10 years ago, and they were surprised that not many churches had followed uh, in their footsteps and achieved the same, the, the same target. Um, but generally, what would you say about examples of good practice? Um, well, there, there are them. I, I think we'd have to go and look at them. I think it yes. might, I think it's always, one of the things we always do is encourage churches when they're altering their buildings to go and look at other churches and see what they've done. Um, clearly, there are examples around the country. Um, I've mentioned one, you've mentioned one. Mm. I don't think, uh, from the DAC's perspective, I don't think we've had a net zero carbon application in, uh, to a DAC meeting. Um, it would be very interesting to get one, uh, to see the whole argument. Um, but um, I would encourage churches that are thinking along those lines to go and see what's been done around the country, find somewhere. Yeah. I think that um, certainly on the Church of England website, um, under their environment and climate change pages, they have got a number of examples, which I think we've both, both quoted or, or, or referred to. Um, and Historic England also, under making changes to places of worship, they have examples within some of their, some of their publications. I think the best things for churches is to ask their DAC if they if they have local examples they can refer to. And I'm sure uh, that Catherine Ross would be, you know, more than, um, more than happy to also make recommendations. If the church is considering a particular scheme or a particular way forward, and we can't find, it, can't find things within our classes, I'm sure if we go to the National Church and Catherine, she would be pleased to help with that. If I can be so bold to, 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 to say that. Yeah. Okay, well, that's the last of um, the questions that I took from the um, people who contacted us before the workshop. Um, so, Sarah, have you got questions that uh, people have been asking or points made? Um, yes, there's a, there's a number of interesting um, comments and questions that have been put forward in, in the chat. And um, um, some of those are around um, balancing, um, of course, the the, the aesthetics of, of the beautiful churches that that we have and um and then obviously making sure that we do tackle ch climate change and um and also around um pe pe what people's expectations are and how we can how we can manage manage that um so yeah there was an interesting question as to um at the moment we've with COVID-19 we're having to increase ventilation of buildings mm -hmm. And um, I suppose it's uh, looking for any suggestions of what we could do to, um, to to get people used to just having to dress very warmly for church, to be used to drafts. Going back to what the, the, the way churches operated 200 years ago, I suppose. People must have dressed warmly and expected to come and, and not be warm in the building. Um, maybe it has something to do with the length of services as well. I don't know. But yeah, yes. That's, yes. That's mm. possible. We, 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 we've had one church in our diocese which was um, subject of a film shoot for, I think it was um, a Jane Austen uh, movie, where George and Box pews were put back into the church for period effect. And in fact, the people in the church liked them so much that they paid for them and kept them in the church. So maybe that's another retro move to cutting out drafts and so on. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems like the conversation has been about removing um, things like that, but then you, you remember why they were there in the first place and mm. cut, they're good at cutting out drafts, aren't they? Um, <laughs> and they're good at socially distancing people as well at the moment. So <laughs> second, second uh, use there. <laughs> yeah. Um, another point that was raised raised on the uh, on the aesthetics was um, was um, asking whether the um, 
that, that saying that maybe screening off heat pumps might um, air source heat pumps, I should say, might reduce their efficiency. Um, and I suppose questioning whether that um, is sort of necessary in a scheme or whether people should um, so should should uh, get used to seeing these things um, as as part of the the image that they the, the see as part of the church, um, rather than thinking that these new technologies need to be hidden from view. Um, PV on roofs as well yeah. being a problem. I think um, I think some of the illustrations of the if certainly the timber enclosures around the, the Essels heat pumps were. Were, were slatted, so there were slots, if you like, between the um, between the panels on the fence. So they were staggered, so that actually air can get through. And I, I guess the same is true about screening with plants. Again, it, it's porous. The plant is porous to air, isn't it? And, but it is a consideration. You don't want to be uh, restricting airflow around an air source heat pump. Yeah. Um... What else did we have? Um, ah, yes. So um, someone also asked about um, if you wanted to engage with the DAC, um, what would who would the right people be to talk to, and what's the right way of, of going about it? Maybe that's um, more for David. I don't know. More for Mark. Uh, I, I think uh, from the non-DAC hat, when I'm talking to churches early on, um, it, the, the DAC will come and visit a church. Certainly at St Albans Diocese, we, we go and visit churches who are thinking about things at a very early stage. So engage the DAC early um, because it will help define the process and it'll help steer a church along the, the, the route that might be um, not, not a very good one um, and avoid that or, and, and help steer them along a route that is perhaps more acceptable um, so, so I think the, the first point of contact will be probably the DAC secretary asking for that meeting at an appropriate moment. Sorry, Mark, I'd agree very much with that. I mean, sort of my, a lot of my background is in planning and we found the same thing with proposals coming forward for planning permission and so on. If you could have an early contact with people, an early chat with people, everyone was moving in the same direction and people weren't wasting time and getting committed to schemes, which possibly would have very little chance of success. So certainly early contact with the DAC um, is the right way to go, I think. And I think now also with the statutory bodies as well, in terms yes. of that, uh, that churches are encouraged to deal with those quickly as well. I, th I think the DAC is the first point of contact for a church, mm. and it will then steer the church if it has to contact other statutory bodies like the CBC, Historic England, the Victorian Society, the Georgian Society, the 20th Century Society, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really useful. Because um, I think the, the, often the information that people lack is just the very first step that they should take and it puts them off. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so getting in, in contact with the DAC. Mm. Okay. Um, we have um, a question from um, Bob Skelton wanting to talk about some, saying something about hydrogen. That, that would be very helpful to know a bit more about hydrogen if anyone has expertise. Okay, I, I will introduce myself. Bob Skelton, I'm a chartered chemical engineer. Um, despite the Newcastle illustration in the background, I'm actually from Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, I have been recently doing a bit of work on hydro hydrogen um, and there's been a, a lot published in the chemical engineering press recently on this. My particular has been more on this transport. But um, yes, it is being looked at and there's a plan for a pilot scheme in the Leeds area. And we've got to remember that up to about 1970, we did use the town's gas was 50% hydrogen. Those people who were around at the time of the conversion will remember that, of course, all the appliances had to be changed because the, um, the um, flame characteristics of hydrogen are very different from that of, that, that of methane. So um, one idea is to blend small amounts of hydrogen into the gas mains, which will reduce the overall environmental damage of, um, 
I'll, 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 I'll be use it using methane, but there are other ideas of a complete hydrogen replacement, but it does come with problems. It will involve a complete appliance change. There's considerable safety problems because hydrogen, of course, is very, very much more flammable, very much more easy to ignite than um, methane. And the old gas mains, of course, the old town's gas mains, um, were tended to be kept sealed by the amount of tar that was left in the old town's gas, which tended to seal them. Um, of course, natural gas has removed all of that, and the chances are we'll get significant leakage. As hydrogen, as anybody knows anything about it, we'll find even the most minute leak because, of course, it's a very small molecule and we'll get out very easily. So there are significant safety implications on the replacement of hydrogen, but it is being looked at as an alternative. I mean, to me, it's, even as a chemical engineer, it's not the ideal solution. I think uh, complete electrification is a better one. Uh, but of course, we've got enormous infrastructure problems. We have a large gas infrastructure, whereas to switch to all electric um, heating, of, and for that matter, transport would involve a huge investment in our, in our, infra, in our electrical distribution, particularly the local networks. Um, but the other thing is, of course, it's at the moment, of course, hydrogen is produced by steam reforming a methane, which, of course, so what it does, it basically the chemical reaction produces CO2 as a byproduct. So at the moment, for every, every molecule of hydrogen, I think you get one molecule of CO2, I have check chemistry on that. Um, so the alternative, of course, is to produce it by electrolysis from um, low, low, low carbon electricity. But here, this is thermodynamically very inefficient. Um, and I know, I know the, the, the government seem to have got like hydrogen at the moment. Dominic Cummings has obviously heard of it and thinks it's a good idea. But um, the other thing you've got to remember is the overall thermodynamic efficiency of hydrogen, certainly as a transport fuel, is less than 30%. By the time you allow for the very poor, the very low efficiency of the fuel cell system, then you've got to press it, distribute it, put it into the vehicles, use it in a fuel cell. You are actually talking about 30% efficiency. Whereas if you go for an air source heat pump, will give you a coefficient of performance of about two, some claim even better than two. Um, a ground source will give you a coefficient of performance of four, which means from one kilowatt of electricity, you get four kilowatts of heat. Do it by hydrogen, one kilowatt of electricity will give you a third of a kilowatt of heat. So it's not, it's, it's not a, it's an idea and it's only real merit is that we've got a huge hydrogen infrastructure. Other than that, it's got no merits at all, I don't think. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. I think possibly we should start to wind things up now. Do you agree, Sarah, or? Um, yes, yeah, thank you, Bob, for that addition. Um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, as you say, hydrogen is being considered very kind of seriously, um, it, but probably in the more medium to long term, I think. But um, as you say, there's lots of hurdles to overcome before then. Um, yeah. Yeah. OK, um, unless there's anything else burning, I'm sure we've got questions still to answer, but um, time is coming to an end. So I think I'll, I'll draw this webinar to a conclusion. I just wanted to thank Mark, uh, Sarah and Carol for uh, making this happen. Thanks to them very much. And obviously to everyone who's taken part today, asked questions, and I hope you found the, the webinar uh, useful. Um, we could do with a lot more time to cover everything, but unfortunately we haven't got that uh, this afternoon. A recording of the webinar, as we said, will be put up on the St. Albans Diocese website, and we'll, we'll add some helpful links to that as well. And if you have helpful links, please um, give them to us. Um, advice is available, as we've said, going first to the DAC team. There's a lot on the Church of England website and on the Historic England website uh, as well. So look there. And don't forget to check out the conference uh, bookshop. Um, I'm just going to end with a uh, point that Mark made, really, that um, despite all the challenges that we've been talking about, net zero, the carbon, net zero carbon price is so important. We do need to act now. And that may be in a small way, it may be a bigger way, but we need to get started. Getting moving with an energy audit is a key first step. And there are some simple things we can do that um, Catherine has pointed out as well that we can get on with, but followed by developing a plan specifically for your church. So I think we all need to get moving, moving on this and overcome those barriers and go forward. So thank you very much to everyone.
Thank you. Thank you.